from San Jose, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's The Cube. Covering QuickBooks Connect 2016. Sponsored by Intuit QuickBooks. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Frick and John Walls. Well, welcome back here on theCUBE as we continue our coverage here at QuickBooks Connect 2016, live from San Jose, the Convention Center. 5,000 attendees, the third year of this event, more than ever, and certainly that explosive growth is uh, personified in what's happening here on this floor in the keynote station, of course at home. If you're a small business owner, you know exactly what we're talking about. Along with Jeff Frick, I'm John Walls, and we're joined now by really one of the most popular authors, most widely read authors in America today, Malcolm Gladwell, five times uh, New York Times bestseller author. Congratulations on that. And, the Revisionist History Podcast, which we love. I love the Wilt Chamberlain Podcast, Big Men Can't Shoot. Thanks for joining us. Great Not to have all. you. Delighted to be here. Yeah, so first off, I mean, tell us about, um, I mean, the whole spirit of this, of this show is about the entrepreneurial capabilities of so many people in the workplace today. I mean, what's your thought about entrepreneurism, if you will, and, and what does it take to be a good outside the box thinker, like so many of these folks are? Yeah, um, well the, I mean the explosion, and here we are in the middle of Silicon Valley, and what this uh, part of the country has done to change the culture of the entire, of the world's economy in the last 20 years, 25 years, is nothing short of incredible. I mean it is, entrepreneurship has gone from something that um, people thought of as the, the province of wackos and weirdos and strange people to a kind of thing that kids aspire to do and be. I mean, that's an amazing mm -hmm. um, transformation. And I think when we, what's happened over the course of that transformation is we've discovered that the definition of what it takes to be good is a lot more, a lot broader than we thought. Mm -hmm. That many different kinds of people using many different kinds of strategies can be effective at starting businesses and achieving. That, um, I think that's been the, the great kind of take home lesson of this, this entrepreneurial explosion of the last generation. Yeah, I think probably with, in all of your works that there are pieces of it that you could extract and apply to this world, but what really struck me, I think about David and Goliath, about advantages, disadvantages, and making the most of your strengths basically. I mean, how do you see that translating or how would you want to communicate that to somebody, a small business owner, who thinks, man, I'm up against a wall. You know, how yeah. am I going to cut through the clutter? How am I going to get there? All this sweat equity. Uh, but yet, there are advantages that they have. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, this talks, of, this is, goes to this issue of learning strategies that there's a kind of learning, what we call compensation learning, where uh, you are learning uh, because of, out of weakness, not out of strength. You're learning from your failures and from your, and that kind of learning is a lot harder to do but it's a lot more powerful. So the task of the small business owner who is facing a whole series of disadvantages and weaknesses relative to much larger competitors, mm -hmm. there's no question it's a harder way to go. Mm -hmm. But if you can pull it off, you have a, you're, you'll end up in a much stronger position. If you can be one of those people who can do compensation learning. And I, I, in, in that book I talk, for example, about how many uh, uh, entrepreneurs are dyslexic. And that's a beautiful example of that. Some portion of people who suffer from quite a serious learning disorder, and not all of them, some portion of them, manage to turn that around into an advantage. To take something, to take an in, a, a basic inability to read and turn that into you know, developing skills of delegation and leadership and problem solving and developing an incredible resilience, uh, uh, the ability to cope with failure. I mean, they, they turn um, uh, 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 a weakness into a strength, and they end up being far more powerful than they would be as a result. And when I interviewed all these successful dyslexic entrepreneurs for that book, what was amazing was that all of them said, I did not succeed despite my disability, I succeeded because of it. Hmm. And that's the crux of it. Um, and I so think there is a silver lining to, the, to many of the clouds that 
small business owners face. It's a really powerful statement because so often people are using drugs and medication and other things to kind of normalize people that are maybe not in the, in the mean, that are on the fringe. But in fact, it's, it's their ability to put a different lens mm -hmm. and see things differently that opens up an opportunity that the regular person just trucking down the road didn't see right in front of them. That's what I meant when I said earlier talking about how our kind of definition of what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur is expanding. I think we're beginning to understand that lots of traits that we once thought of as just problematic have unexpected um, uh, benefits. Like I remember once reading someone who was pointing out that basically most of the great research scientists in the world uh, have OCD. And you kind of have to have OCD if you want to be, because what are you doing? You're spending hours and hours in a lab doing the same incredibly precise experiment over and over and over again and measuring your results it, you know, to the slightest. That's OCD behavior Beauti that has found a beautiful home, right? Has found a world where you need to be that way, right? And that, I read that, I was like, that's, that's lovely. These are people who we drugged up and pushed off to the fringes two generations ago and now we found a home for them in labs where they're they are doing incredibly productive and satisfying work. Yeah, I think you profiled one in one of the podcasts, a cancer researcher who he said nobody really likes the guy, he's kind of an ordinary guy, but he was just so laser focused on the very specific yeah. problem that he was trying to, to solve. He didn't really care, that's what he yeah. was all about. Yeah, no, it's a, I think this, is a, this has been a lovely development in our understanding of kind of human capacity. So where do the ideas come from, right? I, I mean, uh, I'm one of the many, you know, uh, fans, and, and I've, I've read, and every time I read one of your books, I, I'm, it never ceases to amaze me how much you make me think. Yeah. Which is, yeah, I think, why we're all so attracted to it. Because it seems so obvious, right? After you present this beautiful, elegant case, like, I never thought of that. But where do those ideas come from? What, what motivates you to say, yeah. I'm going to write, I'm going to write blank. I'm going to do tipping point. <laughs> You know. I, uh, I mean, I wish I had a system, because right now I'm planning the next season of my podcast, so I need 10 more ideas for that. And I'm starting to write a new book, so I need you know, 80,000 words for that. And I'm wondering, I wish I had a big bucket full of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm running around with my head cut off, talking to people. But I mean, I spent the summer, I probably read 40 books this summer to do with, I mean, uh, apart from, I'm not talking about novels and thrillers and mm -hmm. serious books that I'm trying to get, and I've been going around talking to pe people, just talking to interesting people, trying to work out what I'm interested in and what, trying to just uncover interesting things that will prompt me to go in, in cool new directions. So it's, there is a kind of, you have to let your mind, you know, it's like the farmer lets his field go fallow for a while. You've got to have a fallow period where you just let everything regenerate and then you plant the crop again. But somehow reading 40 books doesn't sound like to me you're letting your mind go fallow. That, I mean, <laughs> that's Well, I didn't have a, I wasn't, I was literally just lying around reading books. It seemed pretty <laughs> fallow to me. <laughs> yeah. What was your fav favorite one out of that read? Or, or the most enlightening one out of that uh, read? They were also, I got on these weird side tracks this summer. I, got, I became obsessed with Churchill's best friend. Uh, Churchill had a best friend who betrays him. And it's this incredibly moving story. And I, I don't know how it fits in what I want to do, but I want to try and make it fit, because it's such a kind of weird and troubling story about this, I mean, a truly transcendent figure in history who has a best friend who stabs him in the back with mm -hmm. consequences for the world. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's just, oh. so I read like <laughs> seven, bizarre, weird, obscure books about this guy. And I was like, that's, it's, there's something there, He's I think. He's out there, yeah. yeah. All right, so we'll pick something that was a little more topical. Last night they had a, a drink-making robot machine yeah. over in the corner making drinks. And it just brings up as we get into more automation, more connected systems. We had the huge uh, knockout of the, of the web last week uh, mm -hmm. from, from the East Coast. As you, as you look at the future, you know, there's kind of the, the, the happy future where the machines do all the hard work and we get to sit around and read books like you did, which is fantastic. And then there's the, le the, the darker potential future where the machines take everyone's jobs. What are people going to do? Mm -hmm. And if it can make drinks and it can, and it can diagnose disease and read every manual that came out, you know, how do people fit? And then there's the middle ground, right? The best mm -hmm. chess player is 
the best chess player in a machine, not yeah. either or. So I'm just curious to get kind of your thoughts as we look kind of to the next big wave of, of AI and machine learning and automation, how you see that kind of shaking out. I think it's important not to overstate how much of our lives we will be willing to let machines take over. Um, so a very, it's been very interesting for me as a writer to observe, for example, what happened with e-books over the last 10 years. So e-books come along and everyone says, the printed book is over. It's gonna, all going to be on, just you know, why would you go and lug around a big heavy book when you can get for a fraction of the cost something to be, and so there are all these ex bloom and doom and expectations. And what happens? Well, it turns out that e-books are still a fairly sizable portion of the marketplace, but it turns out that most people actually want to read a book, a physical object, that that's more pleasurable somehow, that the interaction with this thing, this pages and paper and um, is pleasing. It's part of the experience. Um, and I think that's a useful, no, that's not a robot and that's not AI, but it's an important reminder that um, the way that th the interactions and the activities that make up our lives um, are not just functional activities, they are opportunities for enjoyment and engagement and part of the reason you go to a restaurant is not just to eat the food, but to engage with the people in the restaurant. Part of the pleasure is the person who brings you the wine bottle and says this gives you a little spiel. Now, I can replace that person with a robot, but the question is, do you want to? Now, like, you can do it. And I can imagine a future where the robot brings you the best wine in the world and does some algorithm and gives you the finest wine. But I don't know, if I'm going to an, having a nice night out and I'm paying you know, $60 a plate for my dinner, I kind of want the human interaction. I mean, it's part of the pleasure. Same thing with self-driving cars. It's, it baffles me as a kind of car guy how everyone assumes that, oh, well, by 2020, it'll all be self-driving cars. Wait a minute, what if I enjoy driving a car? Right? We've forgotten this. It's, enjoy it, it's actually quite a pleasant thing to go and to make decisions unconsciously and consciously and drive down the road. And I mean, I like a manual transmission. I like the feel of driving a car. I don't want to give that up. Why should I have to give that up? So it's like, we can, can't get ahead of ourselves. You mentioned the chess thing, which is a great example of this. Can you make a machine that will beat a person at chess? Yes, you can. But it's not chess. Chess is a game played between two people. <laughs> That's why it's interesting. <laughs> if it's played between two machines, no one will watch it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's like, so it's, like it's, it's this absurd thing. Like machine, I can also make a machine that can run faster than Usain Bolt. It's called a car. <laughs> Do I want to watch a race between a car and Usain Bolt? No. Why? <laughs> because what's pleasurable is watching human <laughs> beings race. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but Jeff hit on something, and, and then you touched on it with the car, and I think about GPS, yeah. and, and how it wasn't that long ago, and I kind of sound like you know, my grandfather now, or my father, that you know, we just drove around, right? And, and if you came to the traffic, doggone, I've hit traffic, but now we use applications that take us, and they're using their intelligence. I mean. I, is it possible, can you see like with this generation of kids coming mm -hmm. up now, that artificial intelligence kind of makes our personal thinking obsolete and we don't process like we do, we don't evaluate, we don't analyze, and so we're raising a whole different kind of human mm -hmm. because of the interaction with technology or what we consign to technology. Yeah. Because well, we give up be on different. it. Well, it'd different. I mean, I think that, so let's stick with cars for a moment. I think you, now we have a world where a whole class of people drive their car to work in the morning. And when they're driving the car, the number of things they can do with their imagination and mind is limited. Right? They can listen to music or the news or a podcast, or they can just sit there, but they can't, they can maybe talk on a phone even though they shouldn't, but they can't do work and they can't lie in the back and take a nap and they can't daydream and they can't have a meaningful interaction with more than one person. What we're going to move to is a world where some people will give up whatever kind of pleasure or interaction that came from driving a car and replace it with another kind of interaction. So driving a car becomes, the time that you're in a car becomes a place where an infinite number of things can happen as opposed to five things can happen. And I sort of think that's what the world looks like is we get a, this incredibly complicated mix. Medicine becomes some mixture of 
the computer is going to do all the easy stuff, but half of medicine is about being reassured. It's about your personal fears. It's not about the diagnosis or the which drug you take. And for that stuff, I imagine that we're, not, we're going to have much longer, deeper, more meaningful conversations with our doctors 15 years from now when the computer has taken all the easy stuff off the table or the AI, the robot. So it's like, it's a world, in a many ways that world is, allows for much richer personal interactions than the one we're in now. The doctor really will have, my doctor has no time for me now. He's like, right. I, I gotta move <laughs> gotta you go. out. Gotta, I gotta, right? right? <laughs> I, in 10 years, it's possible my doctor will be able to sit down with me for half an hour with or all 45 the data. minutes twice a year and really talk about what's going on with me and that's the promise of the future. I don't think we're going to have a situation where everything's done by the robot, right? Well, uh, this is one of those occasions where I truly wish we had tons of more time, but uh, you have a busy schedule and, and so we're going to allow you to go on, but thank you so much thank for you. sharing this time fun. with us. Yeah. We've thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. And we look forward to the keynote later. And we look forward well. to the next 80,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with that. Too. Thank you. Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> joining us here on theCUBE. Back with more from San Jose right after this.